Okay. Very good. Let me do the introduction. Okay, let's uh, start the meeting. Welcome to this afternoon session of the ELD MOOC. I am Claudia Musekamp and I will be your host for today. Today we'll learn more about the new UNCCD Soil Leadership Academy. And so I'm very happy that Louise Baker of UNCCD is joining us today from Bonn. Welcome, Louise Baker. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Louise. Uh, so, and you will be joined by Cosman Corandia from the United Nations University today, who will be uh, uh, sharing his insight of the scientific part of the United Nations. Exactly. University. Okay, so why don't you start? Okay, very good. So, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Claudia. Um, I'm going to just do a few quick slides to introduce the Soil Leadership Academy, which we talked about in the last presentation that I did for the MOOC, um, and give you a bit of background about what we're planning. And as Claudia said, I hand over to my colleague Cosmin from the United Nations University, who will give us the methodology and the academic approach that we're taking to build up the science behind the Academy. So, the idea behind the Academy. Um, we go to the next. If we go on to the next slide. Oh, you see that as this is numbers I'm sure you're very familiar with now, we are losing about 12 million hectares of land each year to desertification and land degradation processes. And by 2050, we're going to have an extra 4 billion mouths to feed. Um, and that's going to require increases of production of around 70%. UNCCD makes the case that land under sustainable land management will be more resilient to climate change because land under sustainable land management regulates the climate and builds stronger ecosystems. That means communities are better able to adapt. We'll also be able to contribute to things like biodiversity for plants, species and organisms. So we'll get more production, food, fuel, fibre, we'll protect the forests, we'll retain and regulate water services and give choices to populations about whether they um, have to move first to the cities uh, or then migrate overseas because their land falls out of production. So we're, we're kind of fairly keen and fairly clear on the message that says actually with degraded land you enter a vicious cycle where community resilience, community opportunity falls and um, the risk to communities, to destate the destability, instability of communities in the face of climate change will only increase and get more pressure. Um, and the alternative is also true, that under sustainable land management, uh, you will be able to provide more opportunities for communities, for, bio, uh, for biodiversity, for production, for in the face of um, disaster, in the face of climate change, and for poverty alleviation. So it's a kind of bad cycle or positive cycle. We would like um, that parties to our convention enter a positive cycle. Um, to do that, we face a few challenges though. To get policy makers and to get um, decision makers, whether they be private or public sector, to take land degradation seriously um, is a challenge. That was part of the reason for creating the Economics of Land Degradation initiative and it was certainly part of the reason for doing things like the MOOC training that you share that information with people um, and try to allow people who are in a position to make a decision to make a well-informed decision. And so this was part of the thinking behind the Soil Leadership Academy that we would take that level of, um, of knowledge and the level of information that we've got and try to get that information to policymakers and decision makers so that they could uh, make some smarter choices. If I go on to the next slide now. Um, we have been doing that through lots of different ways. Um, we are currently pursuing the concept of land degradation neutrality and this is a process that got picked up that was initially proposed in um, the UNCCD COP in 2011 in Korea and it's been a process that's been cooking and a target that's been cooking for a while now um, and it looks like it will gain traction 
uh, within the framework of this post-2015 sustainable development goals. What land degradation neutral will look like is that we stop the loss of this 12 million hectares of land each year and that the remaining one and a half billion hectares of land with the potential for recovery and increased productivity will move into this cycle of sustainable land management. That's the, that's the vision. So as we said, we need to make sure that the policymakers move in that way to, to, to do that and make the right choices. And so to allow that to happen, we need the capacity of land users and policy planners and businesses to be increased and we need better land-friendly policy and incentives to be developed and put in place at every level, specifically at country level or at large corporation level, but it's, it is at every level. And land degradation neutrality, where the amount of land that you've got available stays stable or increases, is something that you can do at every level. We're targeting, because we're an international process, the national level, but it's, it isn't, doesn't have to be at that level. So. The idea, the gap, is that there's the capacity of the land users and the policy planners to understand the challenges and then to put in place better policy and better incentives. So this was the kind of the challenge that we faced and what we came up with, with was the idea of the Soil Leadership Academy. There's a couple of elements to the Soil Leadership Academy that just by way of background, we want to turn the science that is out there the knowledge and the information that people are creating all the time into policy relevant products. Things that are important for policymakers are not so important for, um, for people who work on the land, actually. Um, and people who work on the land don't always think in the same way as a policymaker. They have different concerns. So we were trying to develop a methodology that would allow the information and the science to be turned into something that was policy relevant and accessible to a policymaker that speaks in their language. We're currently in the process of the methodology development and my, cousin, uh, my colleague Cosmin will talk you through how the methodology is going to be developed in a few minutes. We will then move on to a process of training and capacity building and that's um, a simulation exercise that I'll try to explain to you later and hopefully it will lead to a commitment to good management, good land management, sustainable land management and restoration by the people who are trained as we move forward. I'm actually now going to hand over to my colleague Cosmin who will talk you through the, the methodology which is the PRISMA model. Hold on one second. Hello everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, that's that's perfect. Okay. the United Nations University joining us to talk about the Prisma model that is sort of the academic background or academic research that is the basis of the Leadership Academy. So please, okay, thank you very much. So, um, regarding the methodology we're going to use, uh, we thought about creating a curriculum for the Soil Leadership Academy, and this curriculum will actually uh, consist of 10 fact sheets. Uh, the fact sheets have a sustainable and strong science behind it, and uh, we're going to try to use all the case studies available out there of the organizations or the people involved in the field in the in uh, in uh, their experience and take their experience and use it in order to create some patterns we're going to we're going to have to put in some models for for the for the participants for the Soil leadership academy to process and eventually implement at the later stage the uh, prisma model was um, used mainly in other areas not necessarily in the climate and environment however lately it was discovered that uh, it was it is very useful to use the to use the prisma model uh, in the in 
the environmental issues. Uh, the PRISMA stands for Preferred Reporting Items for Systematic Reviews and Meta-Analysis. And what is actually doing, it's identifying a problem and then trying to academic research, which is mainly desk and field research if necessary, based on some criteria to solve the problem or to give the solutions to the problem. Um, how am I doing uh, here? No. Okay, yeah, okay. So, um, this is how, for example, we're going to look a model when you have a decision taken, for example, decision one, and based on the uh, science which is uh, behind it and it tells us what uh, what um, happened in previous decisions taken similar to decision one, for example, you have a, a specific impact. The impact is measured and you try to uh, it be identified with uh, some solutions for the policy makers to consider. Um, however, not necessarily that um, the decisions um, which are taken that are um, are not identified as being representative for a region or for a specific community, but um, they are try we are trying to keep them as general as possible in order to be uh, able to be followed as good examples in all uh, related cases. Um, how we're going to try to um, uh, to um, to apply the Prisma the Prisma model to the levels impacts measurements, and uh, it, there were identified three levels, which we are going to be considered in this um, in this in this analysis, and the the levels are the policy. Uh, which we consider to be relevant for the, all the impacts it could have, including legislation and land tenure. Economic, um, which um, for example may consist of taxes, uh, subsidies, incent incentives, investments, and so on. And social, when you are trying to communicate soil, leadership, uh, soil um, uh, sustainable land management, I'm sorry, and changing practices. So based on these three levels, they have different impacts at uh, different levels. And uh, the impacts mainly are represented by productivity, employment, profit, security, and here it includes food and water security, climate change impact as well, and migration. So the policymakers will be able to uh, find out in the 10 fact sheets we're trying to develop uh, what is happening if they take a decision in a specific area. So, for example, um, and this is one of the case studies which was submitted to our um, to our um, to our uh, leadership academy and um, for example, in the case of fertilizers, there is an organization out there which uh, is called the Virtual Fertilizer Research Center and they try to... Hello? I just I, um, heard a ping, and um, they are trying to identify the um, a specific approach towards the use of the fertilizers. Uh, they call it the 4R approach, and the use of fertilizer. They consider the fertilizer to be used at the right time, at the right amount, at the right place. Um, this is, for example, in the levers, it could be, it could be um, the most, the most uh, significant for, for the levers, it will be in the economic one, because um, the social and the policy ones are lower than the economic, um, the, eco the economic um, um, signification of, of these of this fertilizers use. And uh, it could, for example, in the economic one, has um, um, no or low uh, use will lead, will lead to lead degradation, and excessive, excessive use will lead to environmental degradation, including economic incentives and risk aversion. And in impacts, use of actual fertilizers will support increase of agriculture productivity, farm income and employment. So what they are trying to identify in the case studies they submitted to us is to see that um, um, they want to um, consider biology and to consider more friendly, uh, more land friendly um, 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 elements when they are trying, when, we are, when they are using the fertilizers. Um, 
this is a very good example and how um, a decision in the economic area and um, in this specific uh, in particular fertilizers in this case will impact in different in different levels of the society including and including social social um, um, social uh, climate change productivity uh, and employment uh, productivity employment being one of the uh, main affected areas um, um, the, the collection of the case study will continue until September and we'll try, we are hoping to gather more case studies um, representative for us and to see if, um, if based on the, on the people's experience and people um, um, uh, experience as organizations and as persons with the land, with the land management, will help us to understand better the the levels and the, the impact uh, on a, on a hand, and on the other hand, to come up with good uh, practice and uh, uh, good solutions for the for the policymakers to consider when uh, they will gonna uh, attend our training of the Soil Leadership Academy. So now I'll get back to Louise. Thank you. See, there you go, the UN, we're coordinating. We like that. Um, I will keep going, if I may. Um, so th thank you, Cosmin. Cosmin was explaining the, the methodology there about the relationships between a decision that a policymaker can make on areas that they can make a decision in, social, political, economic, and the outputs that a policymaker wants to see. So really, a policymaker doesn't really care about um, generally, some do, but generally is less interested in environmental measurements of success and more interested in measurements of success that will help them stay elected or um, generate wealth and productivity in a country. So it, the idea is to try and sell a move to sustainable land management through an indicator of success that is of value to a policymaker. And you can see the relationship clearly with ELD there. I'm going to keep going um, to say that then, once we have the methodology, we would like to then develop the training as, and we, once we've gathered the case studies and got the evidence together, we will develop the training as a simulation exercise. So rather than take policymakers to a classroom and tell them that you know, this is the effect, we will hopefully generate an environment where policymakers can be put into a situation where they have to act like it's a real life situation. So it should inspire them rather than lecture them. It's going to be developed and so that it can be amended so that it can be bespoke individual training or group training. And it's going to allow people to practice their roles, to gain experience and make mistakes, hopefully in the simulation exercise rather than with a country. So um, the simulation exercise will be developed over the course of the next few months in line with, um, with the methodology that Cosman outlined. I wanted to give you a study of how this might work in real life. This was a um, this was a session that was organised recently by the Economics of Land Degradation in Central Asia. This is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Turkmenistan, and the Turkmen's very kindly invited all of the five Central Asian republics to Turkmenistan to explore the opportunities for the economics of land degradation in the region. And I am excited to say that it looks like there will be a regional project in Central Asia looking at ELD in the region. Then what they did say and what was a very clear message coming out of the ELD exercise was they wanted to enhance the capacity and ability of the policymakers to do these type of ELD assessments on a more regular basis. So this is where the Soil Leadership Academy will jump in, um, in that we will do the regional study and hopefully gain some more information from the case studies that we will then be able to build on the methodology and build into the simulation exercise and train the um, members of the, the five ministers from this region at some point in the middle of next year with the Soil Leadership Academy in the simulation exercise. This, this is just because I wanted to show it, because if can, can we spin out a bit? Can we see? We can't. I need this picture to be smaller. There's a big golden man there. That's me, but under there, there's a big golden man. 
this is perhaps better. This is Hannes from the um, from the ELD Secretariat. I don't know if Hannes is on the line, but um, <laughs> he'll be embarrassed if he is. Um, Turkmenistan has got um, lots of issues to do with desertification. It's a very dry place, and um, the decisions that are made politically in Turkmenistan because of its economics and political system will be perhaps quite different to other places, but we do think that through the idea of inspiring policymakers, we can get them to be bolder and get them to um, to really be passionate about adopting sustainable land management without the kind of educational component being pushed down their throats, but really getting them to ins be inspired to do something to do something different. In fact, I think I'm going to stop there and leave that then for questions because it's the Soil Age of Academy is really um, it's a work in progress. I think we would be looking at get, getting your help if you have got case studies you would want to be included in the methodology. We'd love to hear from you on that. And opportunities to train policymakers and decision makers from the public and the private sector. We look forward to your proposals on how, how we might roll out the Soil Leadership Academy next year. Okay, thank you, Louise, for this uh, great presentation on the Soil Leadership Academy. Uh, I, I think that's really a, a fascinating uh, approach to uh, capacity building. Um, we can open the floor now to questions from the audience. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, almost an all ladies uh, session, yeah. uh, except for Carlos, who is uh, helping us with all the technical stuff. Uh, Carlos from Berlin. So, uh, if any of uh, any one of the ladies would like um, to um, raise a question, uh, please uh, type them. Oh, the sound is not working. Let me. Um, I think, Luis, you can hear me. I can't hear you of this. There seems to be an audio problem um, for some people. Um, if you want to do, uh, if I want to raise a question, please write your questions uh, into the chat. into the chat. Meanwhile, uh, let me ask you, Louise, uh, one question that um, I've been asking myself. Uh, what do you think you will have, uh, are you, you're planning to work with uh, business leaders. What do you think makes uh, the soil leadership particularly attractive? Um, I think the style of the training that we're doing um, will be interesting to the private sector. It's something that can be framed specifically for their decision makers. So we can do this on a one-to-one -one basis with a CEO or with a board because it's a simulation exercise rather than a lesson. Um, I think it's something that the private sector will appreciate because it's not particularly academic. It is um, more about the things they care about. So we, we pre-do the work for them. In the, the it, it's obvious if you have falling yields, your profit will go down if you're trying to grow something. But with the help from ELD and with the help from the methodology from the academy, we should be able to directly indicate how a decision to do something economically, for example, spend your money on subsidizing fertilizers, as Cosmin suggests, right, <laughs> actually may not help you. 
because you may get increasing yields in the first place, but the productivity of your land and soil will go down. There will be alternative options that you can do that mean that you can maintain your yields or grow your yields without spending money on fertilizer and spend it on something else and spend the, those or invest those resources in some other way. So we hope that we're going to be able to deliver the kind of evidence that policymakers and business leaders want to see that's about that measures success in terms of employment, profits, yields, things that the private sector will see as a bottom line. Um, and another question was, uh, you mentioned that uh, science will deliver policy relevant products. What, what would be a policy relevant product in that context? <laughs> um, it would be something that wasn't too scientific. Just in case anybody didn't notice, I didn't do the science. <laughs> um, so I think it, there is a tendency in the field of land management, in the field of soil, to be um, very much focused on the technical aspects of um, of soil. How? <laughs> yes, soil. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, soil really doesn't um, doesn't cut it when you're a policymaker or a decision maker. So it's about transferring the ideas of the technical aspects of soil into something that is accessible for policymakers who think differently. So they think in terms of poverty reduction, they think in terms of growth, and, and in the science thinking about not just the number of worms per tonne, but the importance of the number of worms per tonne. So really kind of thinking about right from the beginning. So speaking the language of the target group is sort of the... And looking at specific policy areas. So look at those areas where policymakers can act. So subsidies, taxation, um, legislation, rather than just providing knowledge and information for the sake of it. Is there are there more questions from the audience? You're free to uh, ask your questions, uh, write your questions into the chat. Um, so, and um, as for the Soil Leadership Academy, will that be a sort of an open academy that I uh, could um, enroll? Our, um, in a, a class in, or would that be uh, only with uh, specific uh, governments? I think in the first instance, we're targeting governments uh, and, and kind of senior policy makers. But then I think the theory is to turn it into an online option. So hopefully um, a simulation ge a game eventually that has the same sort of principle that you can make choices, see the results of your choices. So make mistakes, see the results of your choices, and then hopefully learn from that experience. So then hopefully that will be by the end of 2015, we'll have an online option available for everybody. But the actual tool, we hope, will also come in a box. So you can probably order a box as well and do the training in your own home. <laughs> OK, that's great. Uh, I, I saw uh, on one of the slides, uh, let me just go back, it said that um, um, my, um, migration is... Uh, um, migration, indeed. ...is an impact uh, that you're looking at. So that's sort of uh, turning a national or, or regional issue into an international it isn't uh, partly yeah partly um not entirely though in that migrants move in the first place to the cities if you have degraded land um and you make a choice to not invest in the rehabilitation of your land in the first instance young men move from the land to the cities 
So have you planned for your urban expansion properly? Because if you haven't, then young men will live in slums and they will do whatever it takes to survive. If they don't have opportunities there, they'll keep going. And then it becomes an international issue. But I, I think the international issue is, is one step removed. I think what we would say, though, is that if people invest in sustainable land management, the um, level of movement of young men from the country to the city would be reduced. If a young man can feed his family and stay on the land, be a farmer, make a life for himself, then there's less push. Um, so we, we don't think necessarily that migration is a bad thing. You know, it, people, migrants who move, make money, send money back, can invest in the land as well. <laughs> so we, we're not saying yes or no, it's a bad thing, but it is a result of a choice that you make. And we would want to see sustainable land management, rehabilitation of the land as an investment in rural employment, in rural development, to give people a choice. And uh, I, I see a comment that uh, that uh, this is exactly a big problem uh, in I'm sure. participant city. I'm sure. uh, okay. And how do women fit into that picture, as I see our <laughs> ladies' uh, session today? Well, as you can imagine, women are always the people who get left behind. In the first instance, that's what happens. That the women who don't have access rights to the land are abandoned in a dying village as the men go off to the cities or to try to make a life. And so the women are the last ones standing on an asset that's continuing to degrade. And they're trying to feed their families and they're trying to scratch a living when the kind of investment choices aren't being made. If I may ask our audience today, is that something that you see in your countries? I see that we have uh, a lady, I guess, from Latin America, from Africa, from Thailand today. Do you think, do you observe uh, the same in your place? Okay, the response is a little slow. Okay, so, yeah, please. Yeah, no problem. So it, it's fine. If it's fine. Answer the questions. That's great. Um, if people have got case studies they'd like to submit of policy decisions relating to impacts that policymakers are concerned about. We'd love to see those case studies. Um, and if people have opportunities for training for ministers and high-level decision makers, we would love to start plotting those for next year about how we might start rolling this out. So please do let us know. Okay, so here's the opportunity uh, to get involved with Soil Leadership Academy. Thank you very much, Louise Baker, for this afternoon presentation on ELD and the Soil Leadership Academy of the UNCCD. Hope to see you again uh, sometime with uh, the uh, Soil Leadership Academy in full swing. Very so good. good luck. Thank you very much. And uh, we are looking forward uh, to next week's presentation by Varun Vat of a Syngenta Company. Uh, Varun Vat will uh, tell us uh, more about um, how business uh, can help uh, preserve the soil. So that's Varun Vat from Syngenta uh, for next week's um, afternoon session of the ELD MOOC. Okay, thanks again, uh, Louise. Uh, thank you, ladies, for joining us. Thanks, Carlos, for helping us today. Um, so uh, have a nice week and bye-bye uh, from Berlin.
Thank you, Belen. Thanks, everybody. Speak soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, Carlos, you can stop the recording now.